The Forgiven Must Forgive, part three. And um, we're going to continue where I left off last week. And I got a, just a little bit left over from last week on. Uh, last week we were talking about the nature of reconciliation. And, I, and do, do we just forgive unconditionally? Uh, without any sort of repentance and we discussed that a bunch last week and then today I'm just going to wrap that up and then we're going to get a bunch of great application but I think I have too much for one day so I might have to continue next week Ephesians 4 <clears throat> 31 and 32 let all bitterness wrath anger clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as God and Christ forgave you so, a common objection answered. Last week we talked about how, well, like even Christ, God just doesn't forgive everybody in the world. You have to believe and repent. You have to have a change of mind, and then God forgives you. And then we looked at, do we forgive unconditionally if somebody, like in court, where these people are <laughs> laughing and mocking the people that are the victims after murder, and then, oh, I forgive you. Oh, I don't want them to have the death penalty. I forgive them. No, they haven't repented. Well, those who argue that a Christian's forgiveness must be unconditional will usually appeal to two passages. And we'll look at them real quickly and just get this out of the way. The first statement is Jesus' statement, uh, the first is Jesus' statement on the cross. Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what to do. So what will people say? Well, Jesus forgave those who crucified him. Therefore, we must forgive all those who sin against us, no matter what. The Pharisees didn't repent. The Sadhedrin didn't repent. The Roman soldiers didn't repent that we're aware of, although one apparently did. But if we carefully analyze what Jesus actually said and use the analogy of Scripture, that is comparing Scripture with Scripture, letting the clear passages interpret the less clear, we will not find such a teaching. Christ did not proclaim forgiveness, but prayed for forgiveness for them. Okay, who is them? It's a request for forgiveness. It's a prayer for forgiveness. The them is not specific, so one must be very careful and <coughs> excuse me, in proclaiming that it applied to the high priest and the whole Sanhedrin and uh, everyone who took part in the trial who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, and the crucifixion. So to answer this question, let us consider the following facts. First, the statement occurs not long after Jesus prophesied a curse unto the women from Jerusalem weeping for him. Luke 23, 28 to 31. He promised the wrath of God on Jerusalem, Matthew, uh, and that, that's from Luke 23, 28 to 31. He pray, uh, and then he promised the wrath of God on Jerusalem, Matthew 24, 2 to 35. Uh, at his trial, <clears throat> our Lord promised judgment in the Sanhedrin. Okay, now let me, I, I should have put this in here, but what did he say to the women? Don't, don't, <laughs> don't weep for me, weep for you. <laughs> The Romans are going to, you know, basically, the Romans are going to come and you guys are going to get slaughtered. You shouldn't be weeping for me, weep for, for you. At his trial, our Lord promised judgment on the Sanhedrin, Matthew 26, 64, and Mark 16, uh, 14, 62. Did Jesus pray for those who he knew would not repent and go to hell? Okay, we look in the book of Acts and we find that the Sanhedrin still persecute in the church. The high priest is still totally corrupt and still trying to drive the church out of existence. So did he pray for those he knew would go to hell? Christ knows every one of his sheep, John 10, 14 to 16, and he most certainly could not be asking God to forgive sinners apart from saving faith in himself. Romans 3, 22, 25 to 26, 10, 14 and following, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, and of course, John 8, 24. So God only forgives sin through the blood of Christ, through his atoning death. So if any of those people in the crowd did not become Christians, then the prayer didn't apply to them. 
in our Lord's high priestly prayer, he prays for the elect, but he refuses to pray for the non-elect, John 17, 6 to 9. I pray for those whom thou hast given me. I don't pray for the world, but for those who thou hast given me. Very interesting. Prays for the elect, doesn't pray for the non-elect. Now, why would he deviate from his own divine plan here? The Savior would certainly not contradict himself and, of course, the whole Bible. And then second, this seals the deal. As the Son of the living God, Jesus had the power and authority to forgive sins. We know that because he said to the paralyzed man, Matthew 9, 2, it's also repeated in Luke 5, 20, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And you remember the response of the Pharisees who were listening? Jesus knew their thoughts. This man blasphemes. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, Jesus was God. The theanthropic mediator. He's God and man in one person, 100% God, 100% man. Um, the hypostatic union of the two natures in Christ. After our Lord prayed to the Father to forgive them, he assured the thief on the cross who had faith, today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. But to the thief who mocked him and did not have faith, Jesus said nothing. So remember, when we interpret something, we always have to look at the immediate context, the broad context, and what we call the analogy of Scripture. Once we understand that the three anthropic mediators power, and the three anthropic mediators considering him as both divine and human, and authority, we see the absurdity of the view that he forgave everyone present at the crucifixion, for if he did, everyone there would go to heaven. It's not like, you know, it, Jesus isn't like us. You know, somebody burns your hamburger. You know, oh, don't worry about it, Bob. Uh, sin is sin. And the only way sin can be forgiven is through the blood of Christ. And then third, when Jesus prays for his people as the divine human mediator, remember this, God always answers his prayers. Always. The author of Hebrews says, he continues forever and has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. It's Hebrews 7, 24 to 25. His intercession is efficacious because as the eternal high priest, he's both God and man in one person. He's always at the right hand of God interceding for his people. He prayed for Peter. Peter denied him three times with curses. He prayed for Peter. He didn't pray for Judas. And Peter went on to become a great apostle. Well, he was an apostle, but he, had, he backslid, and Christ forgave him and prayed for him. Christ's prayers are efficacious. Christ said, this is John eleven forty two, 42, I know that you, you always hear me. And that's a Hebraistic way of saying, you always heed me. You always listen to me. You always do what I want. Christ and the Father have one essence, one will, one nature, one plan. Consequently, the Father always answers to the Redeemer's prayers. Okay, we're not infallible. We're not God. We may pray for something and it may not be God's will. But Christ is omniscient. He knows everything. Consequently, the Father always answers the Redeemer's prayer. prayers. To those who object and point to the Lord's petition in Gethsemane, as a contradiction to what we have just affirmed, they need to pay closer attention to the prayer. Now listen to it. This is Matthew 26, 39. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The statements of Jesus in the Gospels about his need to die and his coming crucifixion make it perfectly clear that Christ knew that his vicarious suffering was God's will. He's not praying to remove the cup, but was acknowledging that although his human nature was in severe distress, knowing what awaited him, he was perfectly willing to go to the cross and suffer the curse against sin. 
Father, I don't want to go through this. My human nature, I don't want to, I don't want to go through the suffering and pain. But nevertheless, I'm going to do your will. That's the essence of what he's saying here. The immediate context and analogy of Scripture teaches us that Christ was praying for the elect present of the crucifixion to come to faith in him and thus have their sins forgiven. This prayer was answered on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 37 to 38, the gathering of the elect from Jerusalem, Acts 2, 7 to 38, and 3, 17 to 19, and 4, 4, etc., and all Israel, Matthew 24, 31. Jesus told them, before I... Before I come in judgment on Jerusalem, AD 70, and completely destroy the city and slaughter its inhabitants, I'm going to send my angels throughout the four corners of the land, and they're going to gather the elect out of the land. The elect were gathered. They were warned. No Christians died when Jerusalem fell. They all had fled to Pella in, in the mountains. No Christians died. Only unbelievers died. This view makes perfect sense theologically and exegetically. While the absurd idea is that either God did not answer Jesus' prayer, you have to either believe that, or that he forgave sins without faith in the atoning blood of Christ makes no sense at all. That's why we read the Bible every day, but I encourage people to study the Bible. Get a copy of Matthew Henry's commentary. Meditate on it. Don't just read quickly through it. Oh, I've got to get my three chapters in and I'm going to say a quick prayer and I'm done. Pay attention. The other passage used to argue for unconditional forgiveness is Acts 760. Whereas Stephen is about to die for being stoned, he cried out, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. The basic meaning here is do not reckon this particular sin when dealing out to them the judgment they deserve. Once again, note that he does not proclaim forgiveness. That's God's business. That's Christ's business. It's not our business. Other than, you know, when somebody, somebody sins against us and comes to us and we reconcile and we say, yeah, I forgive you. But once again, note that he does not proclaim forgiveness, but in this case, ask the Lord to moderate his judgment against him. That's all he's doing. And we do the same thing. If you have an unsaved relative and they're dying of cancer, you have parents and they're not Christians, and they may have done bad things to you when you were a kid. Lord, please don't hold that accountable against them. That's all we can do, because we can't forgive sins. We can forgive them for what they've done to us if they repent, but we can't forgive the guilt of sin for the day of judgment. The great, uh, the great persecutor Saul would believe in Jesus and become the Apostle Paul. And he was present there. But those persecutors who did not repent and place their faith in Jesus did suffer the judicial consequences of this horrible sin. Why did God destroy Jerusalem in AD 70? Well, we learn in Matthew 23 why. They persecuted the prophets. They persecuted Christ, put him to death. They persecuted the apostles and the New Testament prophets as well. And they killed a bunch of Christians. So God destroyed Jerusalem. He had it with them. He got a judicial divorce from Israel and gave the kingdom over to the New Testament universal church. What Stephen did was pray that God would have mercy on the Jews who were his countrymen, the people that he loved. Those who were elect and came to faith in Jesus had this sin removed, together with all the, of their sins. But those who remained in their unbelief died in their sins. Therefore, even if we take the position that Stephen was praying for God to remove the guilt of this particular sin from the persecuting mob, then we would have to conclude that God only partially answered this prayer unless every member of this wicked mob became a Christian. Remember, God, God does not forgive sins arbitrarily, like Islam or Judaism, where you just say you're sorry or you turn over a new leaf or you do some good works. No, Sins are only forgiven through the blood of Christ. Remember that. There is no way theologically or logically to circumvent the fact that the guilt of sin can only be removed and forgiven by the sacrificial death of Christ. 
Jesus said, John 10, 27 to 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. When men do not take into account the analogy of scripture and teach doctrines that are unscriptural, they must either ignore clear passages and adhere to an irrational system of theology, or they must interpret the clear passages in an unbiblical manner to support their error. So let's be careful in how we interpret Scripture. And many people are not. Scripture is not irrational. When Scripture emphasizes over and over and over again that we can only have our sins forgiven through the blood of Christ, we can't turn around and act as though that's not true. Now we come to the rubber meeting the road. We're going to talk about clarifications, observations, and applications. We have a whole bunch of applications, and I probably won't even finish it today. In order to better understand our topic, there are a number of matters that need clarification. Further analysis and, of course, application. Therefore, let us keep in mind the following biblical observations, and I have seven. I don't think I'll get through them all today. First, some are short, some are very long. The fact that forgiveness is conditional and the person who refuses to repent and be reconciled is to be excommunicated does not mean that the person excommunicated is to be hated and treated like dirt. They are now in the class of unbelievers and therefore should still be loved, treated lawfully, and with compassion. If somebody's been excommunicated, you can still pray for their salvation. A believer should not hang on to hatred and resentment, for we understand God's providence and must be at peace with all men to the best of our ability. Many professing Christians fall away and apostatize. Well, some fall away and some return. And some, some fall away and never return. I know of a case. I heard a guy lecture when I was in seminary in the late 70s. He was raised a Christian, apostatized from the faith. And then 30 years later, he repented and became a solid Christian, went to seminary, became a, a professor at a seminary. And I know of a case in the RPCNA where somebody had apostatized, raised a strict Christian in an RPCNA and uh, apostatized and then repented in their 60s. People do fall away and then return. Most do not, but some do. Second, Given the popularity of socialism, racism, and class warfare in our day, it is important to emphasize the personal nature of forgiveness and reconciliation. One cannot forgive all white people or some class of men or a whole country or dead people. The Bible speaks about specific provable sins conducted by specific identifiable persons, not general categories. Okay, for example, and this is the climate we live in today, we live in an insane era. All white people are privileged and racist. There's, uh, or, or all rich people are evil and oppressors. Or all people who have more money are automatically oppressors. which of course these categories are, it's not provable and by nature are not specific and therefore are highly inaccurate. The RPCNA in the 1800s had missionaries to the blacks in the South and had a black church and had a black school. Now, because the RPCNA became so corrupt, they allowed that school to become Arminian and heretical, and those people, that, that, that whole thing fell apart. 
But not all white people are racist. That's ridiculous. Some are. Some are not. Some rich people are extremely generous and help the poor, go out of their way to help the poor. Some are not. Some are greedy and selfish. But if you get your money and you don't do it by oppressing people, like by lying and cheating and stealing, that's your money. You earned it lawfully. You know, if you hire somebody to do something, you, or, you know, say, I'm going to pay, I'll pay 20 bucks an hour to do this. And then he complains and says, you're not being just. Well, he agreed to it. Jesus talks about that in the Gospels. Third, the reconciliation process requires openness and honesty from both parties. People who are offended by someone they believe, uh, by something they believe is a sin must clearly identify every area of offense. This is quite obvious, but it's very, it's very important. This point is brought up because there are occasions when professing Christians will speak to one another and then reconcile, but within weeks the supposedly reconciled offended party is gossiping about other issues. This demonstrates that the reconciliation process was not honest, for issues were held back because the offended party did not really want to reconcile and forget. People do this. They deliberately hold back they talk about this, they'll have a, a reconciliation, a phony reconciliation, and then they go right on gossiping and trashing the other person behind their back. This happens all the time. And it's totally wicked. You be open and honest. If there's a problem, you get it all resolved once and for all. You don't get to hang on to things. An insincere or partial reconciliation process does not lead to real forgiveness or genuine reconciliation. People who are bitter will go through the motions in order to say they obeyed scripture when they are really planning revenge in their hearts and are full of malice. I've seen it over and over again. It is very wicked. It is very dishonest. It is satanic. Fourth, the person-to-person -person nature of the reconciliation process teaches us to stay out of matters of which we are not a part unless the offended party asks us to be a witness. That is the second step. In other words, don't go around and be a busybody butting into other people's affairs and being offended for things you're not even involved in. It happens all the time. And I know a couple that were so into this, being offended for every little thing in the church, getting into everybody's business, they were asked to leave two different churches. Please don't come to our church. You cause nothing but trouble. <laughs> Literally, they were met in the parking lot by the elders. Please don't come to our church. Leave, please. We don't want you here. You cause nothing but problems. There are professing Christians who are very judgmental and seek occasions to become angry over issues of which they are not even personally involved. They find fault easily then chafe with bitterness, and thus meddle in matters they have no biblical reason to get involved with. They take offense and see conflict when the people involved are perfectly fine and have no issues with each other. It happens all the time. Such negative, judgmental people will gossip, holding others in contempt, and cause all sorts of problems because they are unwilling to cover over minor rubs with love, and they enjoy quarreling, bickering, and causing strife. When I first entered the ministry, way back in the, the 90s, uh, there was a couple who just didn't like me. The, the woman was, in my opinion, a feminist. And this, this is like 30 years ago, so these people are long gone, and they're not going to hear this. But um, they made a, she kept a list of everything I did that she didn't like. And they went to Presbytery and went after me. They, they sent a list to Presbytery. And these guys who read the list, they, they set up a commission to examine all this stuff. They laughed. N nothing on the list was a sin. It was all this, stu you know, Brian was at the picnic and uh, he made a joke about deer nostrils or something. It was all stuff that was not sinful. These people were just jerks. Such people need to be rebuked for this behavior, not encouraged. Those people should have just been rebuked and the matter should have been dropped by Presbytery. But they went through the whole process. The reason I got 
I didn't have any problems is because every time I talked to her on the phone, I taped it. So I had all these tapes. I just gave the tapes to Presbytery. Listen to these tapes. I'm being nice. I'm being respectful. I'm following scripture. She's being abusive and obnoxious. They need to learn the Christian virtues that undergird a forgiving spirit. People who are easily offended by trivial faults and thus become bitter, angry, and divisive need to learn Christian kindness, piety, mercy, and patience. Love and kindness let the minor rubs and offenses pass. An egotistical, selfish spirit loves to stir up strife. You're all going to experience this sooner or later, so keep this in mind. Fifth, if a Christian is not very knowledgeable and is unsure if a perceived offense needs the reconciliation process, he can ask the elders or a knowledgeable, mature believer about it. But if he does so, he must not mention the person's name who is involved and must respect his reputation because the reconciliation process given to us by Jesus, Matthew 18, 15 and following, requires privacy unless repentance does not occur. We're supposed to look out for each other, protect each other's reputation. Even if a legitimate sin occurred between you and him, it's to remain private. You go to him face to face, you get it. If, now, if it doesn't get settled, you get a couple witnesses and you go back. It's only in the third process where the person is disciplined by the church that it becomes public. There's not to be gossiping at all. So the sin is only to become public unless it is found, the person is found guilty by a church court. The only exception to the Matthew 18, 15 and following process is if there's a scandalous sin like a crime, adultery, theft, fraud, it has to be something that by nature is automatically needs to be public. Crimes are in that category because the person is a civil crime. It's a public matter. It's a public record. Adultery, murder, robbery, wife beating, child molestation, rape, etc. Sixth, a public sin, whether a scandalous moral transgression or the public teaching of serious error or heresy, must be dealt with in a public manner because the knowledge of what occurred has already been exposed publicly. Now, back in 2002, they had the Auburn Avenue Conference down there in Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana, and uh, <coughs> they put out tapes, and you could hear these tapes, and everybody was talking about it. It was a public, it was a big conference, and you had these guys up there, Doug Wilson and these guys, essentially denying justification by faith alone and teaching sacramentalism. It was a horrible conference. And these guys are up there and they're all full of pride and everything. And they're all, you know, we have this new paradigm of theology and it's a new reformation and all this stuff. Well, Joe Moorcraft and others put out articles against this thing right away, back way back then. And the response by a lot of people was, well, you should have called Doug Wilson and followed Matthew 18 if you thought he was teaching heresy. No, it was a public heresy that was getting spread rapidly in the church. And once it's public, you have a right to deal with it publicly. Now, you know, be nice and charitable and, and try to deal with it. But these guys, you know, these guys are snakes. <laughs> these Auburn Avenue guys are snakes because they, they couch things in, a, in ambiguity so they can deny that they're teaching heresy while they're teaching heresy. You say, come on, you're not being fair. Well, they were asked point blank in an interview. I wish I had the tape. They were asked point blank, and this is a, they had Steve Schlissel and all these guys there, and they were asked, well, don't you just mean that the good works that we do are the fruits of faith? And they all laughed. They rejected the Protestant position. So a public sin, as Calvin says, merits a public rebuke. If it's public, it's public. <clears throat> This principle, however, does not apply to sins that have been wickedly spread through gossip. If it did, then those seeking revenge could skip the first two steps of the Matthew 18 reconciliation process by gossiping and tail-bearing, which are unscriptural. 
and I've seen this before. This is actually kind of frequent. People gossip about a matter, and they make it public, and then they act as though, well, we get to go right to the Matthew, uh, to the church court immediately because it's public now because <laughs> you made it public through gossiping. No, you don't get to go to the church court. You don't get to break the rules. This practice of making private sins public through gossip to circumvent Jesus' methodology of reconciliation is actually very common. It's, it's true. People gossip and spread the matter abroad, and then they justify their sin by saying the matter is public, even though they made it public through their evil behavior. If a pastor writes a book with heresy in it or teaches heresy from the pulpit, a public response is warranted and required by Scripture. Now, if you're in church and your pastor says something from the pulpit that you think is wacky, I would meet with him after church and discuss it with him and make sure you understood things correctly before I complained to somebody about it in church. But if, he's, if somebody's teaching heresy from the pulpit, you have every right to go public because it's a public matter. If someone commits adultery or theft, the matter is public due to civil law and is already at the third stage of the reconciliation process. In other words, it is something that must be handled by the church session or court, and the consequences or verdict are to be announced to the whole congregation. A public sin merits a public rebuke. The goal, however, remains repentance, reconciliation, and restoration of the offender. People who get offended by sin think it's their job to punish. No, the job is retrieval, and punishment is only comes at the very end through excommunication. Seventh, and we'll, this, this will we'll spend a lot of time on this. We must not confuse an apology for a biblical confession of sin. In our day, when most people are unfamiliar with the teaching of Scripture regarding sinful offenses, it is very common to say to someone when an offense occur, has occurred, Bob, you need to apologize to Craig and say you are sorry. This practice, which today is virtually universal, does not have any biblical justification or precedent. We don't find it anywhere in Scripture. It's not found in the Bible at all. When the, pra when the practice originated in our society is not clear. The word apology comes from the Greek word apologia. It originally referred to one's defense in a court of law. You or your lawyer would get it before the judge and he would make a defense, an apologia. And the word apologetics is still used among Christians today for the defense of the Christian faith. It's the realm, the foci of apologetics, the defense of the faith. According to the original meaning of the word, an apology is more a justification or explanation of an offense not an admission or confession of guilt. It's a defense, not a confession. Now, over time in our culture, and I'm aware of this, the word apology came to be used as a way of telling someone they are sorry for offending him. I'm sorry, Bob, I spilled your drink. I'm sorry I stepped on your foot. I apologize. The terminology of apologizing should be kept out of the Christian re reconciliation process for several reasons. Number one, <clears throat> the biblical reconciliation process deals with an objective analysis and application of God's law to a situation of sin, while the expression, I apologize, I am sorry, deals with a subjective feeling. Two, One can apologize without admitting sin or guilt. Bob, I am sorry you feel that way. I apologize that I hurt your feelings. Now, there are times when there's no sin involved, where somebody has a complete, you know, uh, misapprehension of what you really did, and somebody said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Bob. I, that's not what I intended or whatever. That's one thing, but it's not to be used in a situation of sin or guilt. In fact, politicians have become experts 
at apologizing when they get into trouble while at the same time excusing their behavior. Apologizing is only really appropriate in non-ethical minor rubs or non-guilt occurring offenses. Okay, you're at a diner. You accidentally bump into a friend of yours and he spills his coffee. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I apologize. That's appropriate. No real sin has occurred and there's no need to confess sin. Three. Well, apologizing can be used to soothe hurt feelings over trivial non-ethical issues. Biblical reconciliation requires certain things. By way of review, A, a biblical identification of a real particular sin must occur. The sinful act or word must be pointed out, and the biblical evidence that demonstrates that that act or word was sinful should be presented as well. That's very important. Both the offended person and the person who committed the offense must have a clear understanding of exactly what occurred and exactly why what occurred is sinful. That's why this whole thing, well, our society's racist. No, there are certain persons that are racist. I lived in West Philadelphia. I've lived in a black ghetto for three and a half years. African Americans are the most racist people I've ever met in my whole life because they've been taught to hate whites. And that's only a, a, a general statement. There's a lot of blacks who are very friendly and not racist at all. We should never make generalizations like that. This point seems rather obvious, yet people are offended, are often accused of things that are not a sin. Oh, Bob wore a purple shirt to church. I remember I was, uh, back in the days of Arminian, being an Arminian Baptist, <laughs> I went to a church uh, where if a man didn't wear a white shirt, especially if he was an elder, he was in big trouble. You wore a purple shirt to church. How dare you? Or Joe has a beard. Or Bill drank a beer while he watched a football game on Saturday. Or Brian does not celebrate Christmas. I've got, got tons of condemnation over that. I candidated at a church in upstate New York back in the first half of the 90s. And um, <laughs> me and my wife were in the very next room in this old, old house. We could hear every word they said. This guy's a kook. We can't hire this guy. He doesn't celebrate Christmas. He's a kook. So they're giving sanctions against me and my wife for doing something that the Bible says not one word about. Now, the Bible teaches that we celebrate the birth, the incarnation, the birth of Christ and his work on the cross and his resurrection every Sunday. As Gillespie would say, we celebrate the whole work of redemption every single Lord's Day. There's nothing about Christmas in the Bible as a separate holiday. So to judge somebody about it is wicked. It's wicked. In addition... People are accused of nonspecific generalities. For example, John, you're a divisive person. Bill, you're unloving. He only cares about theology, not people. And you say, well, that's kind of crazy, but it happens all the time. Brian, you're divisive. Well, tell me exactly what did I do that's divisive? Nothing. Nothing. If you can't identify specific sins, shut your mouth. You're not helping anybody. You're just being a judgmental jerk. General categories are very useful for gossiping and condemning people, but they are useless for identifying specific sins so reconciliation and forgiveness can take place. If somebody's divisive, and you can't tell him specific acts of divisiveness, and you can't give him examples, and you can't explain why what he did is divisive from Scripture, you need to shut your mouth. Often today, divisive means, uh, means this person doesn't agree with me on theology, and I'm corrupt, and I do all these things that are not in the Bible, and he doesn't teach what I teach, and therefore he's divisive. That's how the RPCNA was when I was in it. Brian's divisive. He doesn't celebrate Christmas. Brian's divisive. His wife wears a head covering. Brian's divisive. He doesn't believe in youth groups. Even though I didn't teach on it, people just knew I didn't really believe in it. The way it's practiced today where the church gets it together and kind of requires people to go, when that's really up to the 
heads of households, the fathers, if they wanted to have a baseball game or whatever. <clears throat> if one is accused of a wrong and no one is sure what one has done, or even if sin has been committed, one should ask, what specific sin have I committed? What did I do? Give me a specific example of when and where I committed this particular sin. If one is accused of sin in general, Billy, you are divisive, you are a bad person, then one should ask for specific examples. John, can you give me some specific examples of me being divisive? When exactly was I divisive? What did I do? That is absolutely fair. Jesus and Paul speak about real specific sins, not general categories. Some of the serious problems with general accusations are that A, they're intrinsically vague. Specific Repentance requires a knowledge of specific sins that must be admitted, confessed, and forsaken. Proverbs 28, 13. Many, many years ago, many, many years ago, um, this is long and far away, so nobody will know who I'm talking about. Um, a guy actually brought me before Presbyterian. He said, Brian's unloving. And what had happened was, is we had disciplined a guy's wife for, le she left her husband and she stole a bunch of money out of the bank. And first thing she did was get a tattoo and, and uh, she was disciplined. Now, I was the pastor. I was the, the moderator of the court. I didn't even vote. It, all the elders voted in favor of this. But I was brought up on charges of being unloving. So I told him, I says, well, that's fine. Uh, let's have it. We'll do it at Presbytery. I'm going to bring cameras. We're going to film the whole thing, and I'm going to post it on the Internet. My wife remembers this. The charges were dropped the next day. The whole reason they did he did that was so he could tell people, Brian's been charged. Brian's a bad person. That's wickedness. That's totally wicked. You don't do anybody any good with general vague things. You help people if they sin. Here's a specific sin. Here's why it's wrong. Here's what the Bible says. Will you repent? B. A general accusation reveals that the person making the accusation has not been following Matthew 18, 15 and following, but rather, even if the accusation is true, has been sitting around doing nothing while the person has been sitting in the same way repeatedly. Because when you make an accusation, you are unloving, present tense, present continuous tense, your divisive present continuous tense, what that indicates is that they've been doing it for a while and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting and now you're confronting him. Where if he was divisive, he did something that was sinful, you should have confronted him the first time, not saved it up and accused him of a general category. It is evil and destructive when professing Christians do not follow Matthew 18, 15 and following, but rather keep a long record in their mind or sometimes on paper. I've had people do that. They have a whole list, a whole notebook full of offenses of a person's sins or alleged sins. There's a direct correlation between keeping lists in the mind uh, with anger, resentment, and even hatred. Such practices, coupled with gossip, lead to factions in the church and all sorts of serious problems. Why do you think Jesus set Matthew 18 in process? One, because he cares about retrieving, the whole purpose of the chapter is to retrieve the lost sheep. You deal with sins right away. And C, it is virtually impossible to defend oneself against general accusations. When Christians have been falsely accused of some sin in general, they must respond with a specific a request for specific examples of the sin, the when, the where, the what. Okay? What have I done? When did I do this? General accusations are, what am I, if it's so general, what am I supposed to repent of? Because I don't know what I did that was wrong. And usually these kind of general categories are used when people don't really have a sin they can prove from the scriptures and they just want to basically shaft somebody. They just don't like them. Or there's a theological... Most of, most of the issues I had in the RPCNA were, were doctrinal differences. Now, when I was in the RPCNA, I was in a very conservative church. 
very, very conservative, very unusual. I didn't know that at the time. I thought all the churches in the RPC and they were like that. So I become licensed and eligible to preach. This is in the early 90s, and I start preaching all over the country, trying to get a church, and I find out the RPCNA is pretty bad. <laughs> There's a lot of churches that are kind of evangelical, and they sing psalms as a tradition. They weren't very reformed, and they did all, you know, had Christmas services and all this. You know, One church had a Christmas tree in the lobby. And um, no, I didn't rip anybody. I didn't. I was trying to get a job, you know, so I, but I was honest. I said, this is my position. I don't, I believe it's okay to drink alcohol, beverages in moderation. It's, I believe it's wrong to celebrate Christmas. We shouldn't do it. And uh, that was enough to, for people to strongly dislike me. Now, could have perhaps been gentler or nicer about it? Well, perhaps. But I, I wasn't holding any positions that were unbiblical or contrary to the standards or the covenants, which the RPCNA is supposed to hold. So, when this question is asked by somebody who's totally innocent, he will often get unhelpful equivocations. And I know because I've asked, what did, I, what did I do? Here's some examples. You know what you did. <laughs> That's really helpful. You know what you did. Now, that might be, that might be fine if you're in the kitchen and the, your mom just uh, made chocolate chip cookies and you're supposed to wait and eat them after dinner and you're standing there eat with a cookie in your mouth. What did I do? Well, you know, that, that might be appropriate then, but it's not appropriate in these other examples. Oh, there's, where there's smoke, there must be fire. That was what an elder told me. I said, well, what did I do that was divisive? Well, there's smoke, there must be fire. Here's another one. The fact that you asked for evidence proves that you are guilty. <laughs> Beloved, brethren, the Bible requires specific evidence. It's, when it goes to the session, it's a court of law. It's a church court. It's an ecclesiastical court. There has to be an identifiable sin or sins, and there has to be proof from Scripture that what the person did was sinful. Or, of course, the person will get no answer at all. That's why, in my opinion, the corrupt church court that I was familiar with, they just didn't have trials. They just handled things behind the scenes. And they tell people, hey, go find another church. Get lost. And then we'll wrap this up here because i I, I, I got to save enough for next week. One thing that all Christians and elders should learn from the biblical teaching on reconciliation is that it is wrong, unbiblical, and immoral to hold a, a grudge or have malice or bitterness or hatred in one's heart toward another believer over theological positions and behaviors that are not sinful. For example, for over a hundred years, you could not become a member in the RPCNA, the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America. In the 1800s, it was called the United, Reformed Presbyterian Church in the United States. You could not become a member until you, unless you took a vow not to drink alcoholic beverages. So in the RPCNA, for over a hundred years, Jesus Christ and the apostles could not become members of the RPCNA because that's thoroughly a man-made tradition. So if you did not get drunk, but had a small glass of wine at dinner, or one India pale ale before bedtime, you couldn't become a member. In modern times, Christians are despised who believe and teach that it is wrong to celebrate the extra-biblical, non-commanded, pagan popish day of Christmas. And people are treated harshly and negatively because they don't do something that's not in the Bible. And they accuse the people who don't do something that's not commanded in the Bible of being a legalist. Now, legalism, there's two forms of legalism. Either you believe in justification by faith plus works, or the legalism of you add all kinds of rules and regulations of Scripture that are not in Scripture. The Bible doesn't command us to celebrate an extra-biblical holiday one day a year about Jesus' birth. Doesn't do it. We have a day that we're told to celebrate every week, the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day. And I have a whole book about that on reformedonline.com if you want to read it. When professing Christians and churches go beyond what the scriptures teach and begin despising, shunning, and even disciplining people for not accepting and practicing human traditions, that is, to clench it, 
then that church was grossly violating Matthew 18, Ephesians 4.22, Colossians 3.12, and of course the regular principle of worship. Now, I was in a church where a lady was totally into the NFL football. She loved it. And there was another lady in the church who was very godly and very pious who believed football was stupid. And, of course, it's on Sunday, so if you're going to watch it, you're going to have to watch You're going to have to tape it and watch it another day. Um, but she hated that lady for not liking football. That's totally ungodly. And, of course, that lady proved herself to not really be a Christian anyway. The whole point of Matthew 18, 15 and following is turned upside down and the church is not retrieving or working to sanctify lost sheep, but rather driving Christians away for remaining faithful to the scriptures, the Westminster standards, and our past faithful covenants. And I'll give you some examples next week, but I, there are many examples where you had a person who was strict, a strict Presbyterian who followed the Westminster standards, who followed the covenants, and the pastor and elders of that church were doing things that were totally non-reformed and the person confronted the session and took it to the presbytery because the session told him to eat, eat, you know, jump in a lake and that person was basically mistreated, threatened with discipline and told to leave the church. And that ought not to be, brethren. We are regulated solely by scripture, sola scriptura. We're not regulated by human traditions. Solo scripture applies to doctrine, ethics, church government, and worship. The elder's job is purely ministerial and declarative. Anything beyond scripture, except in circumstantial matters, okay, the elders get to decide we're going to meet at 10, 30, or 11. They get to, you know, they decide when church starts. That's a circumstantial matter. They decide if the carpeting is going to be red or blue or brown or whatever. They get to decide what kind of lights the church has. But they don't get to make up doctrine and they don't get to make up worship practices. But when churches act like that, it's Romish, it's humanistic, it's sinful, and it's destructive. In that conservative church I went to, this guy's long retired now, um, there were things that he wasn't biblical on. I mean, he didn't believe in head coverings. But he would certainly never discipline everybody over something that he admitted was in the Bible and he admitted was practiced in every Christian church, branch of the Christian church throughout the whole world until the late 1960s. And I remember I knew a guy in the OPC who wouldn't sing the hymns, the uninspired hymns. And an elder of that church brought him up on charges because he wouldn't sing the hymns. He would only sing psalms, which is the biblical position. He took it all the way to the General Assembly of the OPC and he won! Because the, OP, the General Assembly, the man had enough honesty and wisdom to say, well, the position he's holding to is actually the position of all Presbyterians until the 19th century. So they showed some wisdom. It is my personal experience, and I've been around a long time. I've been in the OPC, the PCA, and the RPCNA. I've been around a long, long time. That many elders today do not understand that the rulings and practices are to be directly regulated by Scripture. Human autonomy and pragmatism, that is doing what you think is right, what is right in your own eyes for pragmatism, should have no place in the churches whatsoever. My impression of the presbytery I was in for the main part of my being in the RPCNA, I was in the RPC for a long time. My main impression is, is that these guys think that they have an intrinsic authority and could do whatever they want. And that's just not the way it is. You can't discipline somebody and be mean to somebody for doing something for not for doing something that's not a sin. And in this case, it's even worse because people are getting shunned and mistreated for being obedient to the covenants and our standards in Scripture. So, <clears throat> ecclesiastical incompetence and tyrants often ignore scripture, what the scripture requires, and in many cases, what their own book of church order requires. The RPC and a book of church order is actually quite good. You have to have specific sins, and they want you to write them down, and they want you to write down proof text to prove what you're saying. That's not followed. At least it wasn't in the presbytery I was in. <clears throat> so, one must remain, uh, so if they don't do that, one must remain calm, respectful, especially with elders. 
but one must not tolerate clear violations of Matthew 18, Luke 17, Ephesians 4, and Colossians 3, and of course Leviticus 19. One has the right and the duty to ask what specific sin occurred, and if one is not sure that a sin occurred, one has a right and a duty to request biblical proof texts. So you're mad at me and you're shunning me because I don't celebrate Christmas. Okay, show me in the scriptures where I'm told to celebrate Christmas on December 25th, which is a day that we know Christ wasn't born on. It's a day, a pagan holy day that was adopted by the church in the 4th century to get pagans to go to church. Some church orders require that biblical proof texts and exegesis must be put in written form. If believers in local churches, church courts ignore biblical procedures and act pragmatically and corruptly to maintain the status quo or uphold their friends, then one has a moral obligation to appeal to a higher court. Don't just walk away. And a lot of times conservatives just end up leaving because that's what they want them to do. They don't want to have to deal with it because they don't have scripture behind them. So they just get out of my church. I've had, I know three examples where that's happened. Generally over things like Christmas and, and doing things that are unscriptural. If the presbytery is corrupt, one should appeal to the Senate or General Assembly. If the church courts disobey the clear teaching of Scripture, refuse to obey the reconciliation process commanded by Christ, and act like Roman Catholic bishops, then one needs to find another church. It's just sad but true. Now, uh, I'm going to stop there. Um, but uh, we'll continue this, Lord willing, uh, next week, of course. I've got, I've got a whole other sermon on this. And it's just all application. We have a lot of important things to deal with. Now, why am I going into so much detail? Because I've been around a long time, and I see what happens in churches when Matthew 18 is not followed. And I see what happens when people are legalistic and accuse people of things that are not sins. And I see what happens when people go about gossiping and tailbearing and refuse to talk to the person face to face. And it's all bad. And elders tolerate this kind of garbage a lot. And they shouldn't. Matthew 18, if it's followed faithfully, problems in churches will be solved, everybody will be happy, there'll be reconciliation, and the, the important thing is there'll be retrieval and there'll be true edification. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your, your wisdom, your in, inspired, infallible scriptures which teach us what to do. We're amazed. We thank you so much for it. We ask, Lord, that you would help us be obedient, put this into practice, and have us study and learn the scriptures so we know what to do. In Jesus' name.